Today on the Therapy Dogs Australia podcast, Sam and I chat with not one but two special guests about why we don't recommend you take your puppy into a school or workplace environment before they're ready and the common mistakes we see people making when raising a future therapy dog. Melissa Searle, the assistant principal of Movell Primary School, very kindly agreed to chat with us and share her unique experience after making some of these common socialization mistakes. In addition, we are also very lucky to have Amy Hodgkinson join the conversation today. Alongside working with Therapy Dogs Australia, Amy is a psychologist, a teacher, and also runs Therapy Dogs in Education. Her valuable insight and experience with her own therapy dogs working in a school environment offers yet another important perspective when it comes to raising therapy dogs. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode with Therapy Dogs Australia. Today, we've got a nice group. We've got uh, Sam and Melissa and Amy, and we're going to be talking uh, particularly uh, in regards to dogs in schools and everything that sort of goes along with that. But before we get into it, Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Melissa Searle from Movell Primary School in Victoria. Um, I'm the assistant principal at the school. I've been there as an assistant principal for four years at Movell. Um, previous to that, I was a leading teacher in wellbeing at Brookside College for eight years. Um, and I suppose my whole portfolio is about student inclusion um, and in engagement. So I've always had a real interest in having a therapy dog and I suppose when COVID hit, through the department, therapy dogs weren't massive. Um, so we looked into it then. Um, so, yeah, so that's my portfolio, basically, wellbeing. Lovely, lovely. And Amy? Hello, I'm Amy Hutchinson. I am a psychologist and a teacher as well. And I work in a high school setting with my therapy dogs, Wilbur and Lucy. I also am really lucky to. Um, do a few have a few roles and a few hats and I also work with Therapy Dogs Australia um, which has been very exciting and um, I also run Therapy Dogs in Education because I suppose having had therapy dogs in my school and setting up that process many years ago so I've had my dogs since um, in there since about 2016 um, I've fielded lots of inquiries and questions around how do we do this how do we have therapy dogs at our school and that has led me um, to be very passionate about schools doing things well and and um, educating key role holders in schools to really protect student well-being um, and animal welfare and all of the things that come across it. Um, principals are very keen to risk uh, mitigate. So all of those things I think are really important. Um, and unfortunately, um, I've seen um, many poor arrangements. So I'm very passionate about getting some good education out there so that schools can make really informed decisions. So Hence why I'm here today and um, I do what I do. We might say um, some principals are really keen to risk mitigate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shots fired early. <laughs> <laughs> some are motivated by marketing and the wonderful opportunities mm. that having therapy <clears throat> dogs does for enrolments. Um, some are. Some are very motivated by putting puppies on their social media pages mm. and mm. catching up with all of the local schools around them that have got their own dogs, I imagine. Mm. It's probably a little bit of competitiveness, perhaps, mm. maybe. Is that is, is schools a competitive place, Amy and Melissa? Yeah. Uh, like yeah. scoffing at me. Yeah, there was yes. no hesitation there. <laughs> society, society sets that up. We compare NAPLAN yes. scores. We compare yes. all of these things between schools. So it's only natural that we become competitive. And I think enrolments are a big thing, um, especially um, some of your regions that are really competitive around getting the right enrolments and getting the number of enrolments. So absolutely, there's big competition um, yep. between schools. Yep. And what the schools can offer. And if they can mm -hmm. offer something like a therapy dog, mm -hmm. that's yep. like gold standard. Yep. Parents are going, yep, awesome. Yeah. And that's because it's the buzzword at the moment. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Is there well, a funding type sort of like um, motivation behind like 
getting enrollments and stuff? Like, is there, is there, is that financially like, incentive? Yeah. Incentive there. Um, there are many funding, um, motivations because government funding is pending number of enrollments and then obviously yep. school fees um, for some schools will attract um, funding as well mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. then more students yeah. you have yeah that's right and I suppose in government schools you're zoned anyway so there's only so many students you can actually take okay um, and then you go to, you know, how many students do you have with special needs? Because that gives you more funding again. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, interesting. So if you're not yeah. approaching it with the right mindset, then things can get really messy really quickly. Yeah. yeah. And not saying that I don't know a school that would do that anyway, but that's how they'll get more funding. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So um, I might mention as well is that Amy and I, uh, also on the Animal Therapies Limited Queensland State Committee. And this is a topic that has come up for us like like a fair bit. Um, we've, we've, we're paying a lot of attention to dogs in schools because um, like Melissa said, like there, it's, it's a real buzz thing at the moment. And as much as it would be clever for Therapy Dogs Australia to just like, you know, smash as many dogs through our courses as possible, we are coming up against, like we take, we have a screening um, process for taking dogs into our courses. And this is one of the things that we actually um, keep our eyes and ears open for because it is causing so many problems. Um, what we're gonna discuss today is puppies in schools, um, puppies slash young dogs in schools who have not at all um, and also, with that, we'll speak to, you know, dogs with handlers in schools where handlers haven't had any training, dogs haven't had any formalized therapy, dog training and assessment. So we we'll, won't talk as much about that, but we are going to talk about this process of bringing a young dog into a school today um, because Melissa has had an experience that she has um, very <laughs> graciously agreed to share with us um, in the interest of helping other people uh, through navigate this kind of process. And also, um, I really want today as well to help people like manage their expectations for if, you know, they've made some of these mistakes along the way, um, to get in touch with us as soon as possible so that we can help you. Um, even if you're not looking at doing a, a course or you're not looking at doing a course anytime soon, or if you think you've already, it's too late. <laughs> You're beyond help. Get in touch with us just in case um, we can keep the dream alive. But um, also just, you know, managing expectations of teams, because one of the other things that's happening is that teams are going going through and getting to the, you know, the final assessments and getting very upset um, at the outcomes, despite, you know, you know, a lot of work going into it. So, Melissa, do you want to just give us a bit of a rundown? Yeah, sure. Um... So I got a puppy, uh, a Frenchie, probably, oh, he's a, just over a year old now. And when I got him, we thought, yep, perfect. She's going to be our therapy dog for our school. We were all very excited. Um, and then I looked into starting a course because there's a lot of schools, well, I don't, there's, there's a lot of people out there that know you don't need a formal recognised training to bring a dog in. Um, we'll, touch on, we'll touch on that again later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So that's, that's, you know, I, I think it's imperative that you need to have that understanding. They think, the they think they know that, but yeah, we'll move on. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I enrolled Pickles into your course, but before I could begin, I started bringing him in as a puppy and he was, it was the best. People, kids loved him. We brought him in from about, uh, Pickles would have been four months old. Um and it was awesome. He had the best time. It was great. And then on reflection now, what's happened is he started to have an adverse reaction to the kids. Um, and then I let him out of my sight. So I did all these mistakes along the way that I absolutely had no idea I was making mistakes. I thought I was doing the best thing for Pickles. He was playing with the kids, coming back into my office. Um, and like the kids would come in, have one-on-ones with me there. But there were times where he wasn't in my eyesight. 
so I didn't know. You know, the principal would take him for a walk and he loved it. Um, and then I come back after a long weekend and then he started shying away from everything. And mm. then the kids would come at him and he would hide. Mm. Um, and then I didn't understand what was going on. I thought, what's happening? All of a sudden, he's just petrified of these kids. Um, then there was a, a little girl come to the front of my office and then he started barking at her. And I thought, I don't know what's happening. Then he started barking at males that would come up and say hi. Um, so I started seeing a lot of fear in pickles, even though there had been nothing to him that, that had physically harmed him. Um, and I couldn't understand it. So then I sort of stopped taking him thinking something's wrong here because he actually wouldn't even hop in the car at home to come to oh. work. So, um, and then I saw Sam speak on one of her, um, a little podcast or a video saying that your dog can have an adverse reaction. And I thought, okay, I've done all of this completely wrong and I need to start again because I hated the way that he was fearing in my office. You know, I didn't have a crate. I had lots of things that were completely wrong from the start with pickles. Mm. Um, and then I sat there and I thought, okay, so I don't want to put myself in a compromising position where something bad happened. Number one, I wasn't insured um, and there was no way I was going to um, threaten Pickles with harming someone and seeing what would happen after that mm. for him, nor put that myself in that predicament mm. because it was getting worse and I was trying everything to help yeah. him, you know, to, to make him see that this wasn't a threat. But for some reason, he's just gone, nah, I'm not doing this anymore. How often was so, he going, Melissa? How many days a week? Um, that was another thing. At the start, I was bringing him in. Uh, he'd have one day off a week. Yeah. Mm. So it would normally be a Wednesday. So I'd do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off, Thursday, Friday. And by Friday, he was absolutely smashed. And I found at the end of every day was his worst. In the mornings, he was really good. Um, but from lunchtime, no way. And then he started hiding behind my chair so if kids would come and say hello, he was not interested. Mm. Um, total change in him. How fast Complete. was that progression as well? So from, you know, when he was having all this fun and then you started noticing these little things, what time frame yep. were we looking at? With uh, that? I, I think it would be about six, seven weeks. I started to see little signs on reflection. Um, once I did a bit of this course, watching his body language, his ears were back, his tail was between his legs. He was shying away, um, just little things that I actually didn't pick up. I did mm. not know. I thought it was just tiredness. Um, and then it progressively got worse. And that's when he started doing the barking and barking at them. And I thought, oh, no, I'm not having this mm. um, because I just didn't want it for him. That's horrible. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and for the kids. You know, half of these kids had never seen dogs before. And then they've got this Frenchie just barking at them. You know, and I thought, I can't have that. You know, a parent had come to the front and he'd start barking at them. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can't have this, mm. you know. But at the start, he wasn't like that. Um, and that's just a new journey I have to take with him now, I suppose. But um, I kick myself now that I didn't have this training prior to bringing him into school. Yeah. Um, on reflection, I needed this training, you know, just so I knew exactly what, how to make it a success because I've just set him up for complete failure. Um, so, so Pickles has stopped going to school now, is that right? Yeah, after I spoke to Sam, Sam said stop him because yep. we need to have him forget about it all. So I've completely stopped him, yep. And how did you break that to your community? Because that's really tricky when people are expecting to see pickles and have really grown to love him in that environment and all of a sudden we're undoing that amazing work that we've done to em embrace the animal in that community and then we've got a break so yeah um i've just said that pickles need the rest <laughs> yeah i haven't said that i haven't gone into adverse reaction mm -hmm. um he didn't like coming to school anymore i've just said he needs a bit of a rest yeah and we'll see how we go I suppose that's also nice because it means that you're not going to get too many questions about it, like yes. as opposed to saying, oh, he's, you know, having an adverse reaction that opens yes. up this whole conversation you probably don't 
really want to delve yeah. into with people that don't, don't understand, you know. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? Background. And my principal is so supportive. Like she said, mm. you just do what you need to do, Aww. you know, for him. So um, she's really good. Mm. I'm sorry that you went through that. That's a really tough way to um, know what not to do. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? It's such a learning yeah. for me. Um, and I know for a fact I'll never do that again in my life. <laughs> um, and I'll never put the dog in that sort of predicament ever again, you know. <laughs> like I'd still love to have a therapy dog and what happens after this course I'll see, um, but I won't put Pickles through that again if he's not mm. ready. No way. Mm-hmm. So um, just in case anyone's listening and thinking oh, i can turn this podcast off now because my dog's not my dog's not doing that my six month old golden retriever isn't doing any of that so i'm fine and i'm just going to turn this off and pretend that i have not heard this i just want to point out that not all dogs are going to show such overt signs as what melissa's dog has shown frenchies <laughs> are not here to impress you or please you or (laughs) no way (laughs) they are not here for any of that Uh, Mm -mm. they are here for themselves and they are going to communicate quite clearly that um this whole situation is a big karen and they don't want anything to do with it (laughs) so (laughs) if you've got a Labrador or a Golden Retriever or another dog that is more willing to try and please you or a Staffy or a Bully Breed or something that's more stoic, um, you won't see these overt signs. And that's what I was referring to briefly at the beginning when I said, you know, some of these dogs get all the way through our training right till their temperament assessments where either us or one of our locum dog trainers um, finally gets to see this dog and we're like what has happened here like Mm -hmm. what has happened here the video melissa's referring to it's currently on our faqs page on the website if you want to look at it's like a four minute video or something just talking about this issue really briefly um but basically we're seeing team after team after team come through where the unfortunate advice some of them have received has been get that puppy into a school Um, socialize it to that environment if you want it to be able to be in that environment. But I'm here to tell you now, don't do it. Mm. A school setting is not the right place to socialize a puppy, especially if you're working at the school. So Mm. if you're going to visit the school for five minutes at school drop off or pick up and, you know, let puppy see all the kids and things going on, that's very different to having a dog in a school setting um, for a whole day, four days a week. What we know about puppies is that they need sleep. They -hmm. should be awake for about five minutes at a time. And when they get tired, they get grumpy. They're just like kids. So that as they get tired and grumpy, their frustration tolerance is going to reduce their tolerance and sensitivity to things like noise and touch. Think about when you're tired. Do noises annoy you more? Does touch annoy you more? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. So if you think about being a tired puppy, being quote unquote socialized in this setting, it is a recipe for disaster. Yet every single day we are seeing puppies in these totally unstructured environments where when i say unstructured i mean unstructured in terms of a socialization um training exercise school settings are totally out of control yep so you can't you can't control a thousand kids you can't control you know think about things like the bell and stuff like that like all those noises and things like that screaming and yeah and and... the kids running past and Mm. um just wanting to pat him you know offhand and um yeah that that's the thing you can't control those external factors in a school Mm. you've got crowding issues you've got all sorts of problems um and you know if you've got a little golden retriever who's frothing on it i mean that's very tempting then to go no but this dog's very robust and this dog loves it and things like that but please just trust me it might work out like it might they might be fine they might be fine 
But what if, what about when they're not fine? What about when it doesn't work out? Is it really that hard to wait until the dog is 12 months old and you've done mm. some training as a handler? Mm. You've had the dog assessed and trained. You've given them a great foundation to start from. Is it that hard to wait that 12 months? If mm. you can't wait, get an adult dog. But even if you get an adult dog, you have to wait six months anyway. You need to know the dog. Mm. Yep. It's, I know it's exciting and I know it's buzzy and I know we all want to, you know, get in while the iron's hot, like that sort of thing. But at the same time, you know, we can talk more to what about the the attachment trauma for kids that thought that they had a relationship with this dog and it's now barking at them. That's right. Like what what about that? What about the the kids or even the staff that you know the dog was there for months you know and we've got other dogs in similar situations I'm not talking just about melissa's dog no. you've got dogs that are at these schools for months and months and months and then we temperament we haven't even met because we temperament test them and fail them because we're like this dog is having a straight up conniption about life yep. and they've got to go back to the school and say well this dog's not right and like we've got one that we're working with with another trainer at the moment and the trainers said to me I don't know if this dog's ever going to be okay Mm -hmm. you know it's really it's shying away from everything and we've had two trainers look at that dog different Mm -hmm. trainers so you know it's it's very very heartbreaking Mm -hmm. to the whole school community to the the would-be handler to the dog the dog that's now you know spent four days a week which means is really six days of the week with you and is now spending five days a week at home by themselves as an adolescent dog like there is such a flow-on effect yep from doing this and it going (laughs) pear-shaped that it's it's just not worth doing it just wait just wait for us just wait (laughs) we will help you we will Mm. equip you but please just wait think about you know the investment when you get a dog Mm -hmm. like it's not cheap so there's no point in gambling that Mm. just for the sake of you know just wait and I think educate do the study I think otherwise I mean it's one thing to say that oh you know we'll remove them from the situation Mm -hmm. we've made mistakes but sometimes those dogs will never be right or able Mm. to go back to that situation Mm. I think some people think that Oh well, I made some mistakes, and I'll just need to put them into some training, and we'll we'll just get a behavior behavior specialist. Mm. But sometimes that's not. It's they're done. They're never yeah. gonna. They're never gonna be able to go back into that sort of environment. Mm. I think it's yeah. particularly tricky in schools too, because a lot of the time the person driving the initiative and really wanting to introduce a dog isn't necessarily Melissa's luckily luckily in leadership and she um, can make some decisions and she can advocate in a different way but often we have role holders that aren't in leadership and then they have to navigate the pressure that the yeah. school expectations might have so we mm. especially if um, the school are paying for them to do a course or have mm. contributed yeah. towards the puppy or have sold this idea to the PNF or whatever the scenario is, we often have this massive buy-in that we then have to try and navigate, well, how do I meet those expectations? But also advocate for what we know should you know what I've learned we should be doing and that's really Mm. hard especially if you might be the teacher librarian you might be a teacher aide you might be a guidance officer or counsellor and all of a sudden you're trying to navigate these completely different expectations around what this program introducing a dog into the school would look like Mm. and depending on your role that can be really challenging and I think I've come across enough schools that Um, that is the challenge. How do I explain to my leadership team that this is an appropriate arrangement because they're saying, well, if we pay this money and if we do this, this is what we want it to look like and we want them here on this day and we want them here. And so they're setting the rules around how that's going to look. And then you as a therapy dog handler or a prospective therapy dog handler have to constantly navigate that advocacy and say, well, actually... (laughs) is this right? Do I feel good about this? Mm. How's the dog feeling? Maybe it's not a good day for the dog to go in, but I've got this pressure from the school community that 
they want them here on this day. And I'm, I mean, as a mm. therapy dog handler myself in a school, I've experienced that firsthand and had to navigate that. And I know how tricky that is. And certainly some of our teams that don't have the same level of knowledge or haven't done training must find that really challenging to be able to say, well, what can I, you know, I've just appeased them because I don't know why that's not okay. Or maybe, um, yeah, maybe I'm not ready to learn about that. And we get ourselves into a pickle very quickly, um, sadly. And how yucky, what a yucky feeling. Mm. Oh, Mm. of course. Um, Does the Therapy Dogs Australia course cover that that predicament? Um, If you find yourself in that situation? So what we do is we equip you with the knowledge and research base that you need to make good decisions and to be able to advocate for yourself and your dog in that setting based on the knowledge and information that we've equipped you with. Amy's um, consulting business is available so that if anyone is really finding it hard, they can um, do one-on-one stuff with her and get some further advice and information about that. We also have a schools team, school teams, um, like peer supervision group that we keep for all of our school teams when they finish, which we made because we have had the same problem over and over and over again. Um, so we've made this um, group so that the peers can stay connected hmm. um, and help each other out, you know, and not have to reinvent the wheel with everything they ever do. Um, but basically, I just can't imagine how someone who hasn't been equipped with any information or backup advocacy. Hmm. Um, we've written letters. We've written letters to schools before um, to advocate for the dog and handler team that's in the school. Um, things like that. We've got our working with dog agreement that we get every team has to sign to graduate. Um, and in that agreement, there's certain things that we state in there that you can go back to and you can show it to your school leadership and say, I've agreed, sorry, the dog must be under my supervision at all times, blah, 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 blah. We have all these things set up to help you. So if you're listening to this and thinking, oh shit, I was just doing this all myself and wondering why I have this horrific gut feeling, this heaviness every time I take my dog into the school and someone asks me to do something, but I haven't been able to advocate for myself or my dog because I don't have any information or knowledge or support from anybody in the industry. We're here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, come and knock on the door. <laughs> we are here, but we're going to tell you, you need to do the training. You need to mm. do the training. If you haven't done any handler training I don't care how experienced you are as a dog owner that doesn't matter I don't care how well trained your dog is that doesn't matter I need school handlers to be at the absolute forefront and top of their game it is the the most difficult job for a dog in this industry to be doing is school dog so we take it really seriously we offer so much support we have so many school teams every course we do it's at least half full of schools um so we're dealing with it all the time. So we, we're very, very much across. We do supervision with, you know, um, we do group supervision as well as um, peer stuff following on, as well as the individual consultancy stuff. We've got so much support mm. because we love dogs in schools. We want dogs in schools. I've taken my dogs into schools before. I don't work in a school, but I've taken my dogs into schools before. I've got friends that are working in schools with dogs. We love dogs in schools. We love, love, love well set up dogs in schools programs. But what I've had an absolute gut full of is dogs not being looked after and not being advocated for and seeing them get to this point where the dog, like Max said, like they're not okay. This dog Mm. is not okay. Um, And if we've done this to a puppy, especially if it's a small breed animal, they live forever. So this dog has now got a lifetime of, you know, trauma response stuff Mm. that, you can take, you know, some some dogs, like I said, you know, they're not going to be that badly affected or they're fine or whatever, but some dogs will be really quite badly affected and they might never be okay in environments even similar to schools, which sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Sucks for the dog, mm. sucks for the handler, sucks for everyone. Mm. Yeah. And I think you make a valid point that some people might be listening to this and thinking, okay, well, maybe I need to investigate that because I've seen some indicators but I think what's even more concerning is there'll be plenty that will listen or maybe not even listen because they're not ready to heed you know listen to that message or do anything and I 
think we can't just rely on, well, we don't know what we don't know, so that's okay. Um, We have to learn. If we are choosing to implement something new, we're choosing to increase the risk to our students in this context, we're choosing to challenge our dog in this space, it's not okay not to know it's we have Mm -hmm. to we wouldn't start delivering a new therapy or a new um, teaching resource without learning about it we wouldn't just simply say well I do this now we have to learn about it it's our professional responsibility and all of us everyone in a school is trained to some capacity so we should then be saying well this is something new I'm going to introduce I'm going to do the right you know training to ensure that Mm. I'm making informed decisions and I'm making informed decisions Mm. not just for me I'm making informed decisions for a dog and I'm making informed decisions for my school community Um, Mm -hmm. there's been incidents that happen in schools and we can't just rely on the goodwill of parents that say well we knew the dog was there and we've accepted the risks because a, a student's been harmed, like what have mm. we done to prevent that? It's just, it's really terrifying. So this is not just a choice of doing training or not. This is a real responsibility. Um, and, it's, mm. yeah, it's, it's sad when you really um, start navigating some of the arrangements that we hear of or we see happening in schools that the dog's not happy or the community aren't safe. It's just, um, yeah, it's very sad that that's happening in this country. Don't mm. don't think that there's not dogs biting kids in schools. We mm. hear we hear this stuff along the grapevine, um, you know, bits and pieces of information, not from our teams, but although there has been in the past, but you know, dogs bite, <laughs> mm. and they they are, and they, and you know, when this stuff goes down, like people are have been lucky, but it's not been in the media, mm. like it's a miracle that it hasn't been in the media but at the same time it's slowing down our progress in this industry that we're not talking about that dogs are biting kids in schools because or that therapy dogs are behaving badly or things like that because everyone's calling their dog a therapy dog regardless of whether it's been trained on or assessed by anyone regardless of whether the handler's Mm. done any training or anything Mm. like that so now we've got dogs cruising around they're, and then they're calling them well-being dogs or whatever it is that they call them, school dogs, whatever it is they want to call them. But the implication is the same. The implication is that this dog is here to serve, um, to fill a gap and serve a need for the students and the school community. If you're saying that the dog is there doing that, then you're calling it a therapy dog. And it, that that means that you're indicating to those students and parents that that dog has some kind of special training some kind of special situation where they can cope with that level of responsibility. And if a dog gets to a point where they are biting, do you know that that means that your dog is really, really upset? Mm. Which is pretty sad. Like if a dog yeah. is biting, that, that means that that dog is not okay. And yeah. that, It sucks for a kid to get bitten by a dog. We don't want kids getting bitten by dogs, but I don't Mm. want dogs getting to the point where they have to bite. I think that's really, really sad. Yeah, We need to be taking a bit more responsibility as an industry moving forward to to prevent this from getting worse than what it already is. And it's never out of the blue. Never. To say, oh, I didn't see that coming. Like it was just a certain situation. Like there would have been signs and indications leading up to that sort of event. And if you you haven't studied and you haven't properly educated educated yourself but protected yourself and protected the dog, then how are you going to back yourself up if an incident like that happens and you can't say, oh, well, uh, you know, it happened out of the blue, people will very quickly be able to step in and go, well, you don't know what you're doing. Mm. Like, where does that leave you? I think, and the dog. I think, sadly, people think that they're making breed selections that are dogs that are less likely to bite. And I think mm. that's really naive, too, to think, oh, well, if I select this breed, it'll be great when no one's in harm's way. Um, but they really need to be looking at temperament and considering appropriate handling and training and all of the other things as mm. far more important in a lot of ways than breed selection. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and like breed selection will get you so far. Absolutely. Like we talk about that for sure. Like um, choosing the right breed, it's, it's, it'll set you off on a, on a head start, but don't kid yourself into thinking uh, that you're going to like shortcut the rest of the process. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not that it's that you're setting yourself up and your dog up for as much success as possible. Um, but it certainly, certainly doesn't mean that you just get to skip all of the training <laughs> yeah. and all your handler training and everything. Like that's no. Mm. <laughs> that's no, not no. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to temperament, um, that's always very that's always a very interesting topic. And you know, its own podcast episode as well, I suppose. Yeah. But um I'd love to also just dive into what are the sorts of things that like specifically um, when a dog is being temperament tested, particularly for schools, what are the sort of things that trainers are looking for? So basically (laughs) in terms of the dog itself, we want a really, really robust, confident, outgoing dog. So if you think about like your typical Labrador, that's kind of what we're looking for. So if you think of, um, you know, the dogs that walk down the street and they're just like trying to get people to pat them. (laughs) Like like Marla, when she walks down the street and she like tries to make eye contact with as many people as possible. And if they so much as glance in her direction, she's like, gotcha. (laughs) Turns over to them. I just let her do it. (laughs) So we're looking for that kind of outgoing sort of thing. But something that's got some physical fitness to it too. Don't be bringing me no big old fat Labrador and thinking I'm going to approve that for a school. I'm going to tell yeah. you to lose some weight off your dog, mate. So, you know, physical fitness is is important too. I so I know certain schools have got certain setups and stuff like that. But even a bracky dog, I would be saying, "How hey, you going to cool that down?" Like, that sorry, thing, I'm going to put in bracky dog. What do you, you know? The um, squish face dogs. Oh, yep, yep. Pickles. Pickles, oh, pickles, Frenchie, okay. Frenchie. <laughs> dogs, yeah. Pugs, mm, you know, yeah. the big smushy face, but they can't. Yeah. So a school dog is quite an active job and they will spend quite a bit of time outside. Um, so if you think about like sports carnivals, the schools want them at assemblies, sports mm. carnivals, graduations, all that. They, they, they treat the dog like a mascot um, and they want the dog doing, doing the rest and they want the dog there all day. So if you're taking your dog to um, cross country and it's a bracky breed, it's going to die of heat stress. Like you can't even really travel the dogs like they, they, and they're getting worse. So, um, and there's, you know, all sorts of other physical issues with that, but a physically fit dog is going to be really, really necessary for a school. Um, I would say something of a decent size, uh, I'd be, you know, something that's a bit more robust in size. That's not to say that your little chihuahua can't be a school dog. I'm not going to say your chihuahua can't be a school dog. However, um, in terms of, you know, like having a chihuahua, an Italian greyhound or something tiny like that, they are more fragile um, and are going to be more easily overwhelmed, generally speaking. However, you know, I'm not necessarily suggesting we go to the other extreme and take a heap of greyhounds and, Rottweilers into schools either because the larger breed dogs, um, everything's more laborious for them. Mm. So getting up and getting down and things like that, the bigger the dog, the harder the job. So we really want to, like I'm looking for, if I was going to buy a dog to go into a school, I'd be looking for a fit, active um, breeding line of golden retrievers, Labradors, Groodles, Labradoodles. Um, Some of your cattle type kelpie type border collie breeds some of them um they're a great size they've got a good work ethic if they're raised right they can be great um, but those dogs can be a little bit highly strung as well um a little bit more neurotic and some of them can be a little bit sensitive so like my border collie oliver is a flipping amazing dog but i don't know well i've taken him into schools before and he's loved it but i don't know if he would love that all mm. the time um because he's a little bit more sort of offended by you know a lot of running around and silliness and stuff like that um so yeah that general robustness confidence and outgoing nature 
the reason that we need the dog to be so outgoing, excitable is good, right? So people think their dog's too excitable. I'm like, bring me an excitable dog, please. Excitable is good. The reason that we're looking for that is because that dog is going to find the school environment naturally reinforcing. So they get there and they're like, gloves are off. We're having some fun. <laughs> like, <"Woo!" laughs> school day. You know, we want that energy coming from the dog because it's not that hard. We will teach you how to taper that energy. That's fine. What we don't want is the dog that rocks up. So people bring me a dog that's like, oh, they take a while to warm up. And I'm like, nope, you got to put mm. that right in front of a fireplace and let it live out its days. Like, don't, we don't have dogs that need a while to warm up. The reason for that is because that the whole school environment, they're going to have to warm up to that environment all day, every day. And if you think about, so an introverted human versus an extroverted human, an introvert, you know, they shouldn't go for a career where they're going to have to, you know, meet new people all day and go new places all day. They should be in a career where they can do that from time to time. But generally speaking, things are fairly, you know, routine. An extroverted person is the type that's going to like thrive in that type of setting of going new places and learning new things and doing all that stuff. So meeting new people, that kind of thing. So when you, if you put an introvert in an extrovert role, you're going to have a lot more stress than putting an extrovert in an extrovert's role. So we really want to try and choose breed and temperament based off of, um, you know, thinking about the dog's job and thinking about what kinds of um, characteristics is this dog going to have that's going to help me set them up for success in this type of setting. Um, that's not to say, so if you've got another breed or whatever, but they're, they're, they're great and you know that they're going to be great and whatever, that's fine. Like it's temperament's more important. And we're just talking about if you're buying a dog and you're hoping for it to be a school dog, those are the, tra the, the traits and qualities that we're looking for. The things that are going to get you in trouble are one, takes a while to warm up, two, um, aversion to, you know, touch and noise. So touch and noise sensitivities. Um, three, really, really sticky Velcro dogs. So dogs that um, don't do well with, uh like you know new people and things like that they want to be with their owner all the time um it's just so stress it's so stressful for them mm. um and like i said so the physical health stuff as well we're taking a look at the whole picture i don't care how good of a handler you are and how well your dog can go into a drop if i think that your dog is not physically capable of doing the job i'll be telling you to go and get a letter from your vet or um, we send dogs to the physio as well, things like that to try and make sure that these dogs are being cared for holistically. It's not just yeah. about, you know, one or two. We're not looking at one or two things. We're looking at the whole picture um, and we're doing that for the benefit of the whole picture. So we're doing it for the benefit of the handler, the dog and the school community as well as, you know, our reputation as well. We're not sending these dogs out and um, just, you know, collecting money and shipping out bandanas. We're not doing that. Mm, that's good. So we're going to talk as, as well a little bit about um, some of the things that uh, happened with Melissa at her school um, that probably weren't ideal. So, Melissa, can you tell us a little bit about, because um, you and I have already spoken about yeah. um, having the dog in your office unattended yeah. and the setup that was happening there? Yeah, sure. Um, well, my office, I have just, there's really no windows in my office. Oh, up the top there is. Um, and then I've got a door and I thought, well, I don't want the door shut all the time. Um, so I got a doggy gate or a kid's gate. Um, Pickles couldn't get through, but he could also see everything that was going on. So if kids walked past, they actually couldn't get over. Well, one actually did get over, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, and I thought that would be the best option for him. He's got the run of my office, um, and then he can just go to the gate if he wants to, and that would be safe for him. Um, and then as an assistant print, I was always in and out of my office. I actually couldn't keep him in my side. I was always going to 
getting called to classrooms. So he was left there by himself. Um, and that was my rule number one, oh, my mistake number one was having a kitty gate. <laughs> um, two was leaving him all the time. And then I found that he was, he didn't have anywhere in my office that was his safe space. So I didn't have a crate and that was another mistake. Um, so then I found he was trying to hide, like I was saying at the start, behind my chair or under the curtain because he just, on reflection, did not feel safe in that environment. There was nothing that would close him off away from people. He couldn't get his own time in there. Um, so he was always, always on alert, which is now on reflection why he's also so tired. He was grumpy. Um, he'd had enough. He just didn't have his own time. So that was my office mistakes. Where was your Where was your office? Um, sorry, I'm just picturing. Was it so there Within was a the hallway? School. Yeah, in the school was it? Yeah, you sort the of main walk hallway. In. You or... can actually see the main hallway. Yeah. So there's the principal's office, another assistant principal, and mine. So he could actually see everybody coming, going. It's a busy okay. place. Yeah, and there was <laughs> yeah. all the screaming and the place. running and... and the screaming and the yeah. hi pickles at the door and. <laughs> And I'm going, that's okay, because you can't get to them. Like, I just thought, that's great. You know, they're excited to see him. And, and as a puppy, he was really excited to see them. Like, mm. he was going up, going, hi, 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 hi. And um, then it was like a, a, a switch had flipped. Mm. And he's gone, nah, no more. Um, mm. and what I, was the behaviour that he started displaying? Uh, the hiding. The hiding behind the little curtain thing I've got in my office. And then if kids come to the front, they'd go, hey, Pickles, and he'd just sit behind me and his ear would be back. And I'm like, come on, buddy, come up and say hi. And he just wasn't interested. Mm. He just thought, no, I've had enough. And I could see him. It was actually breaking my heart, thinking, okay, what have I done? What can I actually do to fix this? You know, um, because I honestly had no idea. No idea at all. I thought I was doing everything right. Oh, the mistakes. Had no idea. Yeah, well, the mistakes you made, I mean, they make perfect sense mm. if you don't know. Hindsight, like, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hindsight's yeah, a beautiful easy, thing. Easy mistakes to make. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Is that where he was barking as well? Yes. Mm. Yeah. The barking started, uh, yeah, it was about two, three months later. And I did find that the barking got worse after the school holidays. So we'd have that two weeks home, I'd bring him back to school, and then it got worse, progressively worse. Mm. Yeah. So from a uh, dog training perspective, or just understanding dogs, first of all, having the baby gate up, if anyone else is doing this as well. So you know how you see like de dogs like fence fighting? that sort of stuff or yeah. like they're just like going yeah. absolutely bunta like on the other side of a fence or door or something it builds up a lot of frustration in the dog so mm. it's actually really frustrating for a dog to not be able to get to the thing on the other side and dogs that know each other and get along can fight at the fence um and then you like let them in and they don't fight it's there's mm. like this level of arousal and frustration that builds up so we've potentially seen, you know, yeah, early on, Pickles probably did enjoy people coming past, but then we probably started to develop a bit of frustration from that as well. Um, the other issue is that he was unsupervised in there. So we mm -hmm. don't actually know, you know, what, what interactions he had. Um, the other issue is we don't know, there was no one there to facilitate that. Um, those interactions and and guide him on, you know, my safe interactions and also correct behaviours as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're not leaving dogs in scenarios where they can make mistakes and they don't have any guidance around understanding that that is a mistake, especially such a young dog. Mm. Well, so instead of doing a baby gate in the office, it is just fraught with you know, like, and so, and also not being in there with him as well. At times he could have found that scary um, being in there by himself and feeling like he had to protect himself and protect the space. We have to be really careful with therapy dogs um, thinking that they need to protect themselves and protect the space, the space especially. 
they shouldn't feel feeling like they need to protect themselves, but I suppose it can happen. Um, but yeah, so if they feel like they have to protect that space or protect you, those kinds of things, that's a really big red flag. And we need to make sure that that is dealt with um, before the dog goes anywhere ever again yep. <laughs> to the workplace. And you know what, Sam, sorry to interrupt. I felt that when I was in that office, his barking at the fence was much more aggressive. It mm. started to get, and I thought, I don't know if he's, he is trying to protect me. I don't know if that was the case or he was truly petrified. Mm. Um, I couldn't work it out. But yeah, yeah, it was. It could be either, but it's most likely the former. If he was doing it worse when you were there, they they can do. I mean, that's what your dog does at your house, right? Like dogs yeah. protect you and your space. Um, that's you know normal dog behavior. So we have to really be careful that we're making sure that they never get to engage in that behavior at the workplace. We just tell them from the very beginning that this is not a space that belongs to you, and it's not a space that you protect. It doesn't belong to me either. We just work here. So mm. you know, we want to make sure that we've got that right from the get go. And it is a very common mistake that people make. Um, and it's hard to fix it after the yeah. dog's been there for a year barking at the bloody clinic door. It's very hard to fix. Mm. Like it's hard to fix them barking at your front door at your house. Mm. Not impossible, but difficult. Mm. Um, so having the dog gate, like, so if, you know, people are looking for options, please don't put baby gates in your offices, um, whether you're leaving them in there or not, I probably wouldn't do that, but I understand the temptation to do it. Certainly don't leave them in there unsupervised. If you do need to leave them in your office, get a crate, crate train your dog, put them in a crate in the office with a shut door, um, with the aircon on so that they actually have some peace and quiet. If they are stressing in there, turn a radio on for them so that they can't hear all of the noises that are going on outside the room. That's scary. Mm. So being, have you ever been like at night in your house and you hear noises outside, you can't oh, see it. Gosh, yes. You don't know what it is. <laughs> you know, even when, mm. the, even when yeah. the roof makes noises and you're like, I know that's the roof noise, it's still mm. scary because you're like, can't mm. see it. You know, mm. you're inside, like it's, you know, that, we don't want to recreate that kind of scenario for our dogs in school. So let's crate train them, put them in crates, shut the office door um, and, you know, leave some sound white noise on for them um, to try mm. and help make that situation a bit less stressful. Um, the other issue that I really want to pick on is letting that dog go unsupervised with other human beings that it doesn't have a strong relationship with or even if it did, they're not responsible for the dog. Um, that's a really common one too. So we're hearing that as well. So someone else, well, I've had it, people tell me that they've dropped the dog off at the school on days that they've not been there and the oh, school gosh. staff have like taken the dog for the day or like the mm. students have taken the dog somewhere. Um, don't do that. Please don't do mm. that. Every code of conduct that you will read um every guideline that you will read says do not do that you must be with a trained handler at all times the trained handler must have a close working relationship with the dog which means that they've known the dog for longer than six months so even if you want to have an assistant handler they need to be trained they have to be trained to handle your dog they need to know and have a relationship with your dog um, the other issue is the amount of days. So even if you were 12 months old and have been trained and assessed, four days is probably too much. We would say three days most of the time, the three days with the alternating gaps between. Um, that is very eye-opening to a lot of people who think that they're just going to school for five days of the week because that's how much they work. Um, and they're very shocked to find out that we actually don't support that and neither do I think any of the code of conduct support that um, because it's hard work. Dogs, if you're at home, you know, all of us are, we look like we're all at home now. Um, are your dogs asleep? Because mine are, are three dogs asleep yep, in the patio. They're asleep next to me right now. Mm. <laughs> uh, have they been asleep all day? Yes. Yeah. 
the same. <laughs> but every school My team own. I've spoken to that has done the training and is working their dogs two or three days a week describes how exhausted their dogs are at the end of the day and they're factoring yep. in breaks. They're allowing them to have that alone time. They're having naps during the day. So the structure is there and yet the dogs are so physically exhausted and I can say that for both of my dogs they come home um, ready to have their little coma like they're really just I just want to lie down um, and they need to re-energize in order to be ready to go back to school so there's no way they could happily um, do consecutive days um, mm. but on and some dogs will have a great attitude towards doing consecutive days they'll get back in the car yeah some dogs love it my older Labrador Sonny it's co I'm constant with him. I have to mitigate for him how much exercise he does because he froths on it. He absolutely loves it. He would go all day. And if I'm not, I have to supervise him at all times um, of physical activity, because if I don't and someone else is playing with him, they will run him until he literally the next day, he can't walk properly. Yeah. So he will mm. just keep going. He's 11 and a half years old. He will keep going and keep going and keep going and keep swimming and keep swimming yeah. and keep fetching and keep fetching and keep swimming and keep walking and keep running and keep chasing the mower and doing all his favorite things yeah. all day long. He would literally give himself heat stroke. So if I'm mowing in summer, he loves chasing the mower. I just let him do it. So he, if I am mowing in summer, I have to lock him up um, and I'll let him out for a little bit, let him chase the mower around and then I'll lock him up again. Because if I don't, he would literally kill himself doing it. But isn't that mm. the role of a respons responsible parent, whether it be a human parent or a dog parent, we're constantly trying to support our little people to make good decisions and that, you know, to support them to survive. And it's the same with our dogs. We're advocating and we're mm. helping them make good decisions because they're not able to make decisions that are the best decisions to keep themselves um, alive and enjoying that, enjoying the school environment. So really important. Mm. Yeah. And if you're not in tune enough with your dog to know, like it was easy with Sunny, he loves the beach, but every time I took him to the beach, I'd have to leave after 20 minutes because he runs around on the soft sand and he'd pull up the next day with a sore shoulder, a bit of a sore shoulder. And he's going to have a bit of a, a bit of a limp. And that's very like visible to the eye. But if you're not in tune with your dog and they don't have such a visible sign of exhaustion, you're going to end up down a rabbit hole where mm. your dog is starting to deteriorate and they're going, you know, emotionally, mentally, cognitively, and physically are going to mm. fall apart in front of you. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, you'll see a change and it will be a much bigger change. Mm. Um, and that's when you'll notice it. Being it, you've got to be in tune with these really like, like minor and slight differences and changes with your dog, but also just be sensible, just be sensible. Do you like going to school all day for five days mm. a week? Like, no, yeah. <laughs> probably not. Yeah. Like, mm, exactly. you know, I don't like working full time five days a week by the end of, by the time I get to Thursday lunch I'm like, see us, uh, I'll be <laughs> reading emails per, possibly Monday, probably Tuesday. So if we think about our dogs and like the cognitive load for them of having to, even though they're enjoying it, that's great. The load that's on them of having to behave themselves all day and make good choices and control their impulses and stuff like that, meeting new people, finding new smells, things like that. If you can take your dog on a half hour or hour walk, get home and they're exhausted, you're kidding yourself if you think that they can do a seven hour, six, seven hour day at a school and, oh, they're sweet. They exactly. love it. Mm. They're sweet. Mm. Really? Really? And I understand that they love it, but I'm telling you, they're not sweet. And these yeah. are the dogs that are comfortable with their handler, know they've got good advocacy, they've got someone that's reading their body language and, and responding to their needs in that environment. You can only imagine the level of fatigue and distress for dogs that, uh, I hate to say the word facility dogs or school dogs, where the schools have purchased yep. these dogs, which is terrifying to me. And we hear of the scenarios um, that are sadly occurring where we've got, oh, you want to take whoever, I don't want to say a name in case um, it's incriminating, but um, are you going to take this dog to um, HPE and then I'll take it to maths and my students really want yeah. this. And we've got this handing over between staff 
with no training mm-hmm. and then we've got handing over to students oh the students took the dog for a wee walk or the students and it's just terrifying to think well it who's is. actually monitored that dog and um is supporting that dog or are they just here's the lead who's off the I go. Hmm. Yeah. that's right and- and none of those people are going to be, they might all be dog people. Some of them might be experienced dog people. But I tell you, we've had plenty of experienced dog people come through the courses who haven't even given this kind of thing a second thought. I haven't even thought about it. Yeah. And, you know, they're kicking themselves during the course going like, oh, whoops, like I've made all these mistakes. It's like, Melissa, like I've made well, all these me. mistakes. <laughs> whoops. Um, <laughs> which, is, which is fair because on, this is us on one side saying this and other people in the industry are saying the same thing. However. Yeah. The media is saying something different. The schools communities are saying something different. And that is where, you know, we're getting this other side of information that is making it sound like it's plausible. People like Melissa thinking it's fine to bring a puppy into a school because I know three other schools that are doing the exact same thing. Mm. That's where the problem is. And that's why we need to just keep talking about this because it's not Mm. fine. It's not fine for the dog. It's not fine for the students. It's not fine for anybody. We really need to keep moving forward and having these discussions. We, um, on a side note, we won't train a facility dog. Um, so if I find out that a dog is owned by a school, it is not training with us. So Mm -hmm. even though, um, facility dogs are kind of still an accepted thing. Um, and look, we might change our policy in the future. If I can see the industry catch up, uh, and things change for the better for the animals that are involved, but I've only seen horrific circumstances for facility dogs um which are like amy said dogs that are owned by a school or owned by a facility we are seeing zero advocacy for the dog we're seeing incredibly poor management strategies incredibly poor procedures um yeah uh, like we've had to um step in before and we've got no regulation authority so we can't do anything but we've stepped in before and you know contacted places directly and said, we, we just need to let you know that we're really not okay with what's going on. Um, and we've been ignored. So, you know, it's pretty disappointing that, um, you know, we're like, you know, pretty, uh, pretty well versed in the field and pretty well versed in what, you know, needs to be happening for dogs to be safe and for the students that they're working with to be safe. And, I've been ignored from multiple different facilities that have bought and own these dogs. And I I find that really, um, yeah, I just won't do it anymore. So Mm. it's, it's not my trauma. So I, you know, like, but yeah, if you've already got a facility dog, contact us. Um, cause I'm very open hearted to your situation, but I'll be advising that that dog's ownership is handed over to some, an an individual. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think the mm. message really um, is that you don't need to be worried about contacting us because we can troubleshoot mm. a lot of things, but we're very open yep. to helping navigate solutions. And each school will have its own solution. It's really hard to say, well, this is what you should do in a school because every therapy dog handler is, you know, has a different role. Every school mm. has its unique setup and different arrangements even just where an office is or where a classroom is, is unique. So the individual planning required for every school is really um, intense if you're going to plan properly. And I think one of the risks is, um, well, I want to introduce a dog, so I'll just contact this other school that's done that and that's where I'm going to get my Mm. learning from. And then we have this contagion or flow-on effect of just poor practice, then informing poor practice, and then it just keeps snowballing because then it becomes the norm and the accepted, which is not accepted by us because we'll always educate and support schools to make some really great changes. But um, look at where you're getting your information from because if it if you're just talking to somebody that has said, well, this is what I do and it feels okay and, you know, it works here and you're not really looking at informed practice, then it's a really quite a, a, a bit of a rabbit hole to be going down and you're not going to be in a good position if you follow those plans. Absolutely. It's romanticised. The mm, whole concept yeah. is romanticised, but you've got yeah. to look at does it, is it actually supported? Yeah. I don't know how many school dog teams we've got out there, but I would say it would have to be at least a hundred and they're doing incredible work, Mm. 
incredible, incredible work and the stories that we hear back from school teams, schools about students, things like that, the dogs, the loving it, you know, the stuff that we hear back and see back, it's beautiful. It's mm. really, really beautiful. And I love the idea of school dogs. I really do. I loved taking my dogs in. I ran into schools and ran programs and I go into school sometimes to do talks and stuff like that. My dogs love it. So I love it. We want to help you. We have so much support available for school dog teams. Please get in contact with us. Please start the discussion with us because we want dogs in schools. We are absolutely mm. advocating. We want dogs in schools. We just want it done right. And it's the right way for the dog, the right way for the handler who loves that dog within an inch of their life and the right way for the students as well. And the school faculty and when you're connected with organizations like us it doesn't have to be us it could be whoever but when you're connected with an, a training organization you have someone that you can go back to and mm. say hey I need help or hey is this okay or hey do you have advice on this you know if we don't know we can flick you in the direction of someone that does know um, like I said we've got peer groups and stuff like that I know Amy did some um Amy's doing some research in this area and we put her in touch early days with like all these schools and stuff. And she was like interviewing different schools and like they're oh. like what they were doing with their dogs and stuff. And it was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> some of the stories, man, like some of the stories coming back, like, Oh, Oh heck. Yeah. But um, some of the stuff that was coming back was phenomenal. Yeah. You know, so we need to keep talking about it and we don't ever want schools to feel like they can't talk to us about what's going on because we need to we need to learn from them we need to learn from people like melissa just as much Melissa needs to learn from us because i've been harping on about this stuff for a long time but it's not until people start coming back and saying oh shit, that's what i did and it mm. actually really went pear-shaped that i go mm. okay we are on the right track here we're on the right track and Yep, sometimes people will get through and they'll get lucky and it'll be fine. But sometimes people will make every single mistake along the way. And it really does help to like educate us back again to go like, no, we're giving good advice here. Like the facility dog thing. Like I know two facility dogs that have bitten and mm. have had to be removed. Like, you know, I'm just, just trust me. Just trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good idea. But yeah, I just really want to thank everybody, not just Melissa, but like largely Melissa, because she's mm -hmm. sharing her story with you guys today, which takes a lot of friggin' balls to do that. So thank Amazing. you for doing that. And all it I really... can say, all I can say is if people are listening and they think they want to bring in their dog and, you know, they want it to be a therapy dog, please listen. Like, please don't take your puppies in because the torment that I've seen on pickles um, of me just not having that knowledge to set him up for success, I'm kicking myself. Mm. Yeah. Um, you just you've got to get the help, and you've got to get the you've got to have that theory behind. Because once you do, then you'll take the right steps under Sam and the team. Just don't do it. Don't take your puppies, <laughs> <laughs> and don't put them in your office with a baby gate. <laughs> <laughs> so when you um. If you're listening as well, you know, we met Melissa like, I don't know, a month ago. So, and she, you know, she just signed up and was doing one of our courses and, and then she disclosed all this stuff and, <laughs> you know, we're like, uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I hope even the fact that we're having this conversation and that Melissa feels so safe to share her story in this environment helps you listeners as well to understand that you can talk to us mm, you yeah. can talk to us um we're never gonna hang shit on you or you know belittle you or you know be horribly mean to you if we were like that do you think melissa would come and do a podcast and share her story like obviously you know that speaks to the fact that we're we are warm and we are welcoming and we will tell you that you've made some mistakes and and we've discussed with melissa like we're, we're going to train the dog we are going to mm. train the dog and we'll, this dog is very young is absolutely potential that um we can turn this around um but even if we can't we'll train the dog and we'll see if we can you know build some more resilience and ro robustness in the dog um outside of being a therapy dog anyway and as you can hear you know from melissa she's obviously a very dedicated owner so mm. um very easy client for us to work with 
So, you know, be aware of that, guys. Um, don't hide from us. Don't hide all this stuff. <laughs> Come and if you're already in a school and you've already trained with us and you're listening to this going, oh, my God, they're going to, like, burn me at the stake. Don't, no. don't think like that. That's not what we're like. Like, no. I know we get passionate and we get on our soapbox a little bit about these issues, but it's because we're so passionate about it and we want it to be good and we want it to be right. Um, so if you've got any concerns or anything like that, please contact us. Um, you can contact me directly or you can contact Amy directly. So if you have a preference there, uh, Therapy Dogs and Education, chuck that into Google. You'll get Amy's direct contact. Um, and if you want to contact me directly, just come straight to Therapy Dogs Australia, um, you know, or roll the dice and contact her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you've got two options. Like, yeah. I mean, even just in this, even in this situation right now, you actually are talking to the owners of two different businesses. Yeah. So you actually do have two different options, even though Amy works for me for Therapy Dogs Australia. She has her own business as well. So you can actually be in contact with her totally separate to Therapy Dogs Australia. Um, same if you've trained with another training organisation or if you've trained with us and you're like, nah, I can't, these chicks, you know, ah, if go just go to another training organisation, you know, go yeah. somewhere else and get some more advice and get some more help. Go to your local dog trainer, whatever it is. Um, just talk to someone mm, and try and get it. advice. Talk about mm. it. Just talk about it. Um, but I promise you, if you come to me, it's it's going to be fine. I know it mm. probably feels like it's not going to be fine, but it is going to be fine. <laughs> but if you're not ready um, to deal with it yet either, uh, you don't want to talk to anyone about it, please please just start changing, making some changes at your schools. Um, no one's got, you know, I don't have regulatory um, powers to stop people from doing things. So if you're listening to this and you've got a bit of a funny feeling in your tummy and you're feeling a little bit challenged by it, which is how I feel when I listen to basically any podcast I ever listen to. So if you are feeling a little bit challenged, <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is bring it up. I'm triggered. <laughs> oh, triggered. <laughs> Turn this off. <laughs> I'm just trying to drive to work. Damn it. <laughs> so if you're feeling challenged, you're feeling triggered and that sort of stuff, um, you've got that funny feeling in your tummy, sit with that. Try not to push it down and avoid it too much. Sit with it. Sit through it. If you're not ready to deal with it right now, that's fine. We get it. Okay. I'm not dealing with all my shit right now either. So that's all good. <laughs> So if you're not ready, you're not ready, but just start. We've already given you a few tips in this podcast. Just start getting, making a few little changes. Just do what you can. Um, just, you know, cut a day, reduce a day, things like that. Um, start not letting your dog out of your, out of your sight. Cite the ATLs, the Animal Therapies Limited Code of Conduct says not to do that. So mm. cite that. Start taking those documents into your school. Start coming up with some advocacy stuff like that just make even little changes along the way and that feeling is going to start to change that yucky feeling will start to change and you'll start to feel like okay i've solved 20 to 30 percent of my mistakes and so now i'm ready to talk to sam yeah. <laughs> if you need to do it that way that's fine um yeah if you just need to move into state and change your name guess do that I don't know. <laughs> like, as a backup plan i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Classic. <laughs> anyway, contact us, guys. Yeah. There's a lot of support helpful. available. Yeah, there is. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank Melissa. you. Thanks, thanks Amy. Welcome. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you're interested in studying with Therapy Dogs Australia or you have a few more questions before deciding, please get in touch with us by emailing courses at therapydog.com.au or visiting our website at www.therapydog.com.au for more information and FAQs.